we got units of 16 or so. Um, but I'm not going to say too much about Silver Bayonet uh, because, A, it's not the topic, but, but also it's still a long way away, and I don't like to talk too much about a game too far in the future uh, just because, for one thing, I might change it before, before it actually comes out. Um, and I've gotten in trouble in the past uh, talking about games too early, uh, certainly before they're printed. Um, something came up with uh, Frostgrave, the second edition. I mean, it's minor, but like I mentioned bears as being specialist soldiers. And then by the time I actually finished the book, they weren't anymore. And it's, it's caused confusion on down the line, even though it's written in the book. <laughs> so, all righty. I think it's, it's probably time to get started. Uh, so hello, I'm Joseph McCullough. Uh, I am a writer, game designer living in Kent in the UK. So it is about five o'clock here. And, and then when we finish up, I'm gonna go put the kids to bed. So a little different. Um, and we have been in a lockdown for the last three months and pretty much for most of the last year. So thank goodness for things like this so that we can still have some, some gaming fun and, and still feel like we're, we're part of a big community. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a bit about Stargrave which is my new war game coming out from Osprey Publishing. It's coming out next month. Uh, official launch date is April 27th, although it may start appearing a little bit before then. Uh, before I go too much into that, I am going to kind of run down all the rules and what you want to do to get started. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about myself and my background, because I don't know how many people here actually know who I am um, or how a guy with my accent ended up in the UK because I'm originally from North Carolina, but um, but more because I think my background as a gamer informs the games I write and the, and the philosophy I've formed along the way is an important part of the philosophy of this game and, and all the games. And, um, and some of the games that have gone before this have obviously had a huge impact on this. So I won't spend too long talking about that, and then I'll get into the core of the game, the mechanics, and what you're going to want to to paint up and get ready. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future of the game. And then I will open it up for questions. So here we go. So as I said, my name's Joe McCullough. I am from Greensboro, North Carolina, originally. And I started gaming about the age of 10. Uh, I found a copy of Dungeons and Dragons at a yard sale, brought it home, tried to understand it, failed. Um, amazingly, my father then picked it up, figured it out, and became my first game master. And that kind of launched me into a career in gaming. Um, from there, I, I played a lot of GURPS, Merp, uh, Call of Cthulhu, a lot of the, really all of your, your big role-playing games of the 80s and 90s. Um, and then I went off to university, and I spent four years hanging out at a gaming store. Uh, the legendary Cerebral Hob Hobbies in Chapel Hill, which is no longer there, but um, was a classic game pit. It was literally below ground, and it literally didn't smell too good. But I spent four years playing pretty much every game that came out, and I ended up getting a job there. And um, I worked on Tuesdays, and Tuesdays were so dead in the store that I would go in in the morning and I would pick out a Reaper figure from the rack. Uh, Reaper was, was pretty new at the time, but I would pick one figure out and I would spend all day painting it. Um, and I would occasionally stop and sell some magic cards to somebody. And that was pretty much a Tuesday. That's Reaper Hobbies until everybody kind of arrived at night for, for gaming. But, um, but still it was, it was mostly role-playing there. Um, I did a lot of figure painting, but I was mainly role-playing. And then, after I graduated university, I moved to Washington, D.C., and got a job at Dream Wizards, which is another gaming store, which, which still exists up there in Rockville, Maryland. And that was the first time I got really became part of a wargaming community. So there are a lot of 40K players there, a lot of Warhammer Fantasy players there, and some War Machine. And um, so I was working, so I didn't kind of interact. In, I didn't play a whole lot, but I obviously interacted with a lot of people. Um, and one of the things that 
I learned there that I'd never really learned before is that most gamers tied the official figures to a game. So I remember having a conversation with one guy where he really wanted to add a bone giant to his, his Tomb King's Warhammer army. And he said, but it's too expensive. And I said, well, why don't you get this Reaper figure, this Reaper bone giant or skeletal giant? You know, it's half the price and it, it's actually a better figure. Um, but he couldn't do it. He, <laughs> no, I can't do that. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not Warhammer. Um, and, and that was actually an important moment for me because I honestly couldn't understand the logic behind that. Um, it's the, if you want this figure, then then get this figure and play with this figure. And, and why why are we tying the game so tightly to the figures? But um, but anyway, I moved on and I ended up going to Wales, Bangor, for post grad, a course I did not complete, and partly because I, I I met a wonderful lady and I ended up marrying her, and so I got stuck here in the UK, and. I've been here ever since, uh, but I got a job for Osprey Publishing, who were at the time famous for doing military history. They did um, a series called Men at Arms and a bunch of series doing highly illustrated military history books. Um, and while I was there, Osprey slowly got into wargaming. Um, and one day I was complaining to the editor the the game the head of Osprey Games as he is now at that time he was just the editor in charge of the games line that there was no game that really did what I wanted um, at the time I wanted a, a fantasy warband game that had a strong kind of campaign narrative almost role play element to it and he challenged me and said well if you want a game like that write a game like that and if it's good enough I'll publish it. Um, and credit to him, true to his word, I, I wrote the game, which became Frostgrave, and he published it. And at the time, I didn't, it was kind of just a bit of fun. Um, I had been trying to be a writer, but a writer of kind of nonfiction and fiction, not gaming. Um, but Frostgrave proved extremely popular. Um, and slowly, I became a war games designer, um, just by kind of doing a bit more, a bit more, and then another game and a bit more. Um, but to bring it up to the present, so pretty much as soon as Frostgrave came out, so for the, sorry, for those that don't know, Frostgrave is a game of wizards fighting in a frozen city for, for treasure that's just lying about uh, an ancient frozen city. And um, so as soon as that game came out, people kept asking me, when are you going to do a science fiction version? Um, and at the time, I'd just written my first war game and I was like, whoa, I, I'm not ready, uh, you know, but now five years on, I have learned a huge amount about both that specific system and war game writing, war game creating uh, in general. And so while I've always loved science fiction and I always wanted to write a sci-fi game, I didn't, I didn't feel ready. Until, until recently. And so then I uh, began work on Stargrave. And I don't know how many people here uh, are very aware of Frostgrave and, and how many aren't. So I apologize if I'm gonna cover a few, a bit of old ground, but because um, basically Stargrave uses the same very core mechanics. Um, that that Frostgrave does, but obviously these have been modified a lot or changed or had pieces bolted on uh, to make it more sci-fi. <laughs> and not just to make it sci-fi, but also to make it a different game experience. Um, one of the reasons I didn't want to initially jump right into writing it was I didn't want to just replace all the fireballs with laser guns, uh, because then you're basically playing the same game um, just with a different kind of coat of paint on it. And I wanted to make sure that by the time I had the game complete, it was a different play experience. You felt like you were playing a different game uh, because, you know, I want to give people that variety and I want to give a game that matches the setting. Um, 
And uh, I'll leave it to you guys to decide whether I did that, but uh, hopefully so. So let's take a look at it. Here, here it is again, here's Stargrave. As you can see, it's not too thick of a book. It is 176 pages. Uh, I tried specifically to keep it thin uh, <laughs> so as to not intimidate people. I think it's I think it's actually important to present people with a rule book that is approachable um, and and one that doesn't intimidate so that they think, well, actually, I can pick this up and I can read it and play it. And actually, it's it's really less intimidating than that because most of that is kind of scenarios and, and gear that you can find and such. But um, so let's dive in. Uh, so the first thing you do when you're setting out to play Stargrave is you got to create your crew. And so crews in Stargrave are usually going to be 10 figures. There, there's a little wiggle room in that some ways, but but for the most part, 10. And two of those figures are a lot more important than, than the others. Uh, that is your captain and your first mate. And un unlike Frostgrave, so in Frostgrave, you, you had this kind of setup too, except you had your wizard and your apprentice. But in that case, your wizard and your apprentice were directly related. Your apprentice was sort of a lesser version of your wizard. That's not true in Stargrave. In Stargrave, you have your captain, and, and he is the best guy on your team, and you have your first mate, and they can be completely different. Um, so the first thing you do for either of those is you choose a background, uh, and there's there's 10 different backgrounds to choose from in, in the main book, and I, I hope to develop a few more down the line. But um, so your backgrounds, let's see if I can remember them all. I probably can't off the top of my head. But um, you got a biomorph, a cyborg, a psionicist, a techer, a robot expert, a veteran who's your soldier, a rogue, and I can't remember the other three. But um, a mystic, I should probably be able to remember that. Uh, and... Oh, there's only eight. That's right. <laughs> That's why I can't come up with ten. There's eight of them. Um, but anyway, so whenever you pick a background, uh, two things happen. One, that background modifies the statistics for that figure. So some of those guys will make you a better fighter. Some of them will make you better at shooting. Some of them will give you more willpower. Um, and some of them, all of them really give you some option in there so you can with the veteran, like he is better at sh shooting, but he can also be better at fighting or he can be faster. That's your choice. Um, and those backgrounds, like I said, you apply to both the captain and the first mate, and they can have completely different backgrounds. So you can have a cyborg captain, but a mystic first mate. Um, you can have a mystic for both if that's how you want to play it. So if you want to play kind of a, a Jedi and his Padawan, you can do that. Um, but if you want to play like, uh, your rogues uh, could be, you know, somebody more like uh, Han Solo, uh, but you could also have a uh, Tekker, who's kind of your your engineering expert, uh, can be your Scotty. So you could have that kind of setup going. Um, so you pick your backgrounds, and that, that modifies your statistics. But more importantly, each of those backgrounds comes with a set of core powers, um, and these are the powers that that background is better at using. Um, so I think they have a list of, let's see, eight. Yeah, so there's eight core powers. And then when you're designing a captain, you basically have to choose five powers. Three of those are going to be core powers, and two of those can be anything. Um, and you're going to be better at using those core powers than you are the anything. Um, we should probably talk a little bit about what powers are. So powers, I, I named them powers because I couldn't come up with any other better uh word to describe everything that can be a power. Really a power can be a, a power in a kind of superhero mystic sense, or it can be just a skill. Um, so if you're playing a mystic, your core powers are going to be things like telekinesis or, uh, you know, trying to, uh, let me use psionicists. So psionicists can, you know, summon fire, can, can move things around mind can can create walls whereas the soldier's powers are, are more like skills he can actually like target specific individuals and direct fire onto them 
He can modify weapons to make them more powerful um, and things like that. Uh, whereas your rogue has things like a concealed firearm he can pull out at some point, or some of these don't actually occur during the game. So the rogue can actually try to bribe someone on the other side before you start playing so that he doesn't pull the trigger at the, the moment you really don't want him to. Or the rogue is also, if he has the fortune power, is lucky and may get a reroll when he needs it. So there's a lot of different ways you can go by combining the different backgrounds with the different powers. And again, your your captain can be totally different. So over the entire warband, you can have uh, you'll have nine different powers, five with captain, four with the first mate. And so you have a lot of different capabilities. Um, and if you're smart, you'll take some of those capabilities as in-game capabilities and some of those as out-of-game capabilities. So some things that help you directly with fighting your enemy or achieving the objective and some things that may help you uh, sell loot. So like the rogue has a power that anyone can have, but the rogue is better at it to, to haggle basically. So he sells, he sells the stuff they find for, for more money. Um, so that's your first two guys, your, your captain and your first mate. Um, and like I said, huge variety there and trying to bring that kind of sense of role playing into the game, because you really have these characters and these characters are going to grow and develop over the course of the campaign. And the, so they're kind of your PCs. And then you've got eight soldiers who are your, your NPCs, essentially. They're the rest of your crew. Um, and these are divided into specialists and standard. And um, your standard soldiers tend to be either, you know, your basic guy with a gun uh, or your basic guy with a club or your, your kind of hacker and your cracker uh, for a better lack of a better term, uh, but basically your guys who break into data and your guys who break into physical things. Um, and then the specialists, you have better versions of all those, but then you also pick up people like the sniper, the grenadier, uh, the, I can't remember what he's called, but the guy who's got the rapid fire gun, which can be a machine gun or, you know, a multi-laser kind of thing. Uh, your flamer, those kind of guys, the guys with the special weapons or the special skills. Um, Somebody's asked about robots, so I'll just say, so whenever you recruit a new soldier, you can declare whether they are a robot or not. So basically any soldier can be a robot. It doesn't cost any more money or anything, but that robot will come with the fact that it is a robot gives it both special advantages and special drawbacks. So obviously like the robot now no longer has to worry about breathing, which is, you know, quite useful sometimes in space, uh, but is more susceptible to some of the powers, is more susceptible to certain kind of energy discharges and things during the game. So if you want robots, you can have all the robots you want. Um, with, the, with the exception, you can't make your captain or your first mate a robot, um, but that's, that's a game balance thing. Obviously, if you want kind of a robot first mate, uh, if you want something rules-wise, you can make him cyborg, but mostly robotic. Um, but if you wanted to depict him, as a robot in the figure, absolutely fine. Um, and I should address that for, for people who are not aware of my games. Um, so every, every game I've ever written is miniature agnostic. Um, go back to that story I was telling about the kind of bone giant and, and playing it with the game. I mean, one of the reasons I wrote Frostgrave originally was I had this big collection of miniatures, a lot of Reaper miniatures, a lot of Reaper wizards, and there was just no game to play with them. And I also wanted a game with like lots of random encounters so I could use all these trolls and, and, and you know, orcs and monsters I had. So I, I did that as well. So, so when you're, when you're getting your captain and your first mate and, and really all your soldiers, you can use any miniatures you want. Um, for the soldiers, it's really a matter of kind of what equipment they're carrying. So if they're carrying a rapid fire, which is like I said, the meat machine gun, get a miniature with a machine gun, nothing else really matters. You know, that it can be an alien, it can be a human, it can be a robot, it can be, you know, an amorphous blob as long as it's holding the machine gun, he's your machine gunner. Uh, so that said, there, there will be official miniatures for the game. 
uh, there's what they call what North Star, who produces the miniatures, uh, does a Nick starter, which is kind of a uh, pre-order campaign, uh, obviously to make fun of Kickstarter, but um, except it's totally different in that all the stuff is going to exist, whether it's actually bought or not. It already, most of it already exists and, and, and certainly will. So it's just a chance to kind of order stuff early and, and get a few extra bits thrown in for free. Um, and one of the exciting things, especially here at ReaperCon, is that most of the figures for the range, including three plastic box sets that are coming out at the same time as the game, are sculpted by Bobby Jackson, who has done a lot of my favorite Reaper figures, for one thing, but also a lot of the figures for the Frostgrave line and, and other things. So that should be cool. Um, so yeah, so get whatever spacey figures you want, and um, as long as you can basically match them up with whatever soldier they represent, you're good. And you're only talking about 10 guys aside, so you only have to be semi-close. And as long as your opponent can figure out which guy's holding the grenade launcher, you'll be absolutely fine. So that's building a crew. Obviously, it's a little more involved than that, but that's that's your basic. Uh, and then we get into the core rules of the game. So if you've played Frostgrave, you'll understand the very basics of the game. It is totally a D20-based game. Uh, combat still basically works the same way in both players rolling D20 um, and the higher one winning and, and that role both determining who wins the combat if you hit and how much damage you do. So a very, a very quick and bloody system. But um, but from there, it starts to, to diverge a bit. Uh, one thing I found was just the fact that basically everyone in the game is carrying a gun makes for a very different game <laughs> than Frostgrave, where most people have to run up and try to, to attack each other. And this, this really changed the dynamic of the game, and it changed how kind of powers work compared to spells in Frostgrave. In, in Frostgrave, your biggest attacks are your spells, and your scariest things are your spells. And I didn't want to just kind of carry on that idea in a, in a setting where a guy can be holding a flamethrower or a grenade launcher. I didn't want to just up the power. So I had to really think about what powers to put in the game that, that make that more interesting. So I'll, I'll leave you guys to explore the flat powers in more depth when it comes out. But, but you can see how there's really a decision. The captain always has a decision, which is more important to use the power to just shoot at somebody here, which, which a wizard doesn't have. Um, so one thing, one way I made the powers more attractive is that, um, so if you've played Frostgrave, you know, whenever a figure goes, it gets two actions, um, one of which tends to have to be movement and the other one can be, you know, cast a spell or shoot or fight. Um, and in this case, it is the same in that one of them tends to have to be movement and the other one can be shoot or fight or use a power. Uh, in this case, though, whenever you use a power, you also get an, addi an additional free move um, called a power move, which is a little shorter than a normal move. But this changes the tactics quite a bit because now it's possible to pop out, use a power, and pop back, um, you know, or to just move farther in a turn where you use a power. So it, it makes it a little more a little more dynamic for the for the captain and the first mate. They're just capable of a bit more than the other soldiers. Um, I also had to do a lot in how a game that's, that's more about shooting works. So partly that's done through, obviously you have these different weapons with a flamer and a grenade launcher. Suddenly you have templates because I just really like templates. So in the, in the back of the book, we do actually have some templates, let me show you here. The classic flamer, uh, your grenade and your smoke grenade. Uh, and these are kind of used for some different things. You'll also use the flamer template for some of the powers and such. But um, hopefully that'll, that'll be fun. Um, another thing that's different is that whenever you are hit 
in Stargrave and take damage, uh, if that damage is over four points of damage, the figure is stunned. Uh, the figure that was hit was stunned. So they basically go down. Um, this actually grants them a bonus to not getting shot later in the turn because they're now huddling in a blue ball. Um, but it means that they basically lost an action for their next turn because they're going to have to spend an action getting back up. And again, this makes some, um, it just changes the way uh, you think about shooting and think the way you think about your turn because now it becomes advantageous to do damage to another figure in a way that wasn't before. So in Frostgrave, if the guy's running away with treasure and you shoot him with a crossbow but don't kill him, he just keeps running. Uh, in this case, he will not, um, or at least he won't run quite as fast because he has to spend some time getting back up. Um, and so, so that's another one that it doesn't seem like a huge change, but I think it'll be really felt during play uh, in the same way that the kind of the power move doesn't seem like a huge change, but actually when you get down to the, the play in the game, it really changes some of your tactics while you're playing. Another thing that's going to change the tactics and another thing that's kind of a seems small, but again, is a big change from Frostgrave is there are now two types of loot in the game. So in Frostgrave, you have treasure tokens and everybody's trying to grab treasure tokens. In Stargrave, uh, your kind of standard game is to go after loot tokens, but there are physical loot tokens and there are data loot tokens because in the, the future, you know, not all treasure is, is gold. Some of it is information uh, or schematics, you know, kind of stuff. So, and the other thing is all these treasure tokens start the game locked. They can't be moved. Uh, they can't be picked up. Someone has to actually go to them and unlock them. And that's where you get your, your hackers, that the hackers are better at unlocking the data loot and your other guys are better at smashing open chests to actually get the physical loot. And, um, and there's powers that relate to both of these. So some, there are ways to unlock these remotely using the right powers or even move them around. So like some of the, like the techer can cause the data to jump from place to place. Um, so, but again, this, this changes the, the kind of whole dynamic. It's not so easy to run up and just grab and, and scoot in, in a way you could in Frostgrave somehow. Uh, it also changes in the fact that once you picked up data loot, you can actually still run fast. Whereas if you pick up physical loot, you're slowed down. So there's, there's a dynamic there of which loot maybe do I want to go for at this moment? Um, what penalties does it have? Which am I better at getting? Um, and when the game's over, you're actually going to roll on two different tables for what you found based on whether it was data or whether it was physical. So there's, there's some overlap on those tables, but uh, there's, there's more types of treasure loot for in this than, than there was before. So, so that's the core rules. I'm sure I'm not telling you a lot. Um, like you said, a lot of it is the same as Frostgrave. Um, using powers, I should, I should address it, that not only do you have a power move, the powers, they work the same way in that uh, you have a target number, you're rolling a d20, you have to roll over it, uh, and you can exert yourself, uh, you know, basically spend your health to make that power go off if you roll too low. Uh, there is a new mechanic, though, that some of the powers have what I call strain. So basically some of the powers are taxing to use. So they basically cause you damage. So it's another level of, do I want to do this? Cause it hurts. Um, <laughs> and there's also some of the powers that suffer from armor interference. Essentially it's harder to use them if you're wearing armor. So there's certain powers that basically you don't want to be wearing combat armor and trying to use these powers. It just doesn't work too well. You're, you're blocking yourself off from whatever it is you need to use those powers. Um, let me just I'm going to take a quick look at some of the comments here, just in case I'm missing anything. Uh, suggested table size for two-person game is two by two, uh, two and a half by two and a half. Um, really ain't that three by three. You can play two by two, but that's going to be over real quick. Um, two by two is my favorite. You can go three by three. Um, 
if you're adding more players than that, so four players, I would definitely want at least three by three, maybe even four by four. Um, but you're, you're still talking a small table. Um, like Frostgrave, you're still going to want to crowd the table with stuff, maybe even more than Frostgrave, because, um, you know, everybody's got a gun. So you don't want huge open line of sights. Uh, uh, I'm going to get into the scenarios in a second. And so I'll talk a bit about that. Um, well, before I talk about that, let's talk about the table in general. So I've said there's there's these different types of loot tokens, but um, one thing that I love about having a whole galaxy to play with in a war game is the fact that you can literally use any terrain you have in your collection and justify it pretty easily, you know? So if you've got forests, you can play in forests. If you've got a dusty border town, play it in a dusty border town. You know, if you've got swamps, jungles, even if you've got medieval villages, that's fine. Maybe you sit down on a, a low tech planet. And um, like I said, in when you're kind of playing a standard game, it really doesn't matter. You know, as long as there's a bunch of terrain on the table, it doesn't matter what kind of terrain that is. So if you want to do it based on Star Wars, you know, Mos Eisley or the Dusty Towns and Firefly or you know, the crystal cities of wherever. Great, go for it. Uh, makes no difference uh, for the most part. And you should, should totally go for that. Um, in the book, I have included 10 scenarios. Um, and I, I do admit for people who wanna play the scenarios exactly as I've, I've written them, you're gonna need a lot of different terrain because I've set each one <laughs> on a different planet uh, in a completely different set of terrain. But I hope nobody freaks out about that because remembering what I just said, you know, if I say this is set in a swamp and you change that to a town, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. You know, there's occasionally there's a few rules that you're going to want to figure out how to, how to sort out. But generally, if I say put a big building in the middle of the table, it really doesn't matter whether that's actually a building or a burned out farmhouse or just a big rock. What's what's really important is the location of it on the table and kind of its footprint. So, you know, if you've already got a lot of 40K terrain, if you've already got, you know, a lot of terrain for, for anything, really, like most of my terrain is actually temperate. You know, I've got nice forests and rivers. And so my, my gang apparently is going to specialize in being more, you know, fighting on those pastoral plants. <laughs> so, yeah. Any terrain you want, go for it. But um, I have included 10 specific scenarios that do have their own kind of settings. Um, and, you know, one of those is one of those is in a swamp. One of those is in a, uh, one of my favorite ones actually is in a spaceship hangar. So basically you, you were somewhere and you were trying to make a deal and the pirates, we'll get to later, uh, have raided the place and everybody's just trying to get out of there. So for that one, if you're playing it exactly written, you do need five spaceships on the board. Um, Obviously, you can use whatever you want as spaceships. So if you just want to use blocks or whatever, put them on there. It's really just important that you have five distinct pieces of terrain because in that case, the, the terrain may start taking off and leaving. Um, and you don't want to be standing very close to that terrain when it does that because you know, back last. Um, there's a snare that's set right at the bottom of a sky city. So um, you can fall off. <laughs> there is a there is a scenario that's set on a derelict warship inside of it. So you you got you got there first. You found it. You're you're trying to grab it before anybody else. You know, not all ship, but you know, whatever good stuff is still in there uh, before anyone else comes. Uh, there is one set in the sewer systems, basically under a big city. Uh, there's one set in a nice pastoral farm. Uh, and there's a few others. Um, so all of those have their kind of own special rules and usually either very distinct uh, rules for the, the loot tokens or special ways to gain experience outside of, um, outside of the normal ways. Uh, so, so yeah, so tend to get you started and really you can um, play 
you know, you should be able to set up your own pretty easily. Uh, question about solo. So the game, the, the book, sorry, does not include specific rules for solo play. However, I've now been in lockdown long enough that um, over the last month, I have created a mini supplement, which I am nearly done with, and I am hoping to give away at the same time the game comes out. And that's called Dead or Alive. And um, it basically allows you to set up a solo scenario where you, you roll randomly several times to see basically who's your mark. So basically, who's your bounty? Who are you going after? Where is it set? Uh, what kind of gangs he got and kind of what what additional complication there is. So you basically, you roll up a, a random scenario and uh, and you go for it. And it's got some simple rules for solo play. So hopefully, even if you're still stuck in lockdown or if you just have no one to play with, then hopefully as soon as you get the game, you can try it out. You can build a crew and you can roll up a random, a random uh, scenario. And, and give it a go and um, you know, learn how deadly the game is before you, you play somebody else. <laughs> so um, just to answer the question again, uh, the next starter I believe is starting early next month. Uh, the, do the rules cover three plus players? Yes. Um, the rules aren't overly concerned with how many players you have. Uh, so I've kind of, Assumed you're going to have between two and four. Uh, you can play with more, though the game does start to slow down significantly after after four. So that's your scenarios. Then you get through the scenario, your game is over, um, and that's that's when the real fun starts. Because first you roll for your loot, you see what you got, and um, there's lots of different kinds of loot you can get. So at your most basic, you get money. Uh, you can also find advanced technology. So in, here in the Ravage, Gal Ravage Galaxy, everyone's fighting generally with below the best stuff, but the best stuff's out there. If you can find it, there's still examples. So you're trying to trying to get the better guns and the better radio equipment and the better everything. Um, there's also you can also find information, which you can barter and sell off, or you can convert into experience points because you utilize that information. You can discover secrets, uh, which again, you can sell off, or you can basically use to try to find specific items. So you learn the secret location of X, and you basically, when you play the next scenario, you can essentially cash in that secret to try to find the specific thing. Uh, you can find alien artifacts, which are kind of your more powerful uh, items that, that tend to interact with the powers that the captain and the first mate have and give them bonuses. There, so there's really a lot of different kind of presents you can get <laughs> in the game. Um, you also uh, gain experience points for all your scenarios. Uh, either there is a basic table for if you just play kind of a basic game, those are the experience points you get, and then there's special stuff in the scenarios. Unlike Frostgrave, so basically in this case, if you get 300 experience points, say, in a game you can choose whether to spend that on your captain or your first mate, and, and you can split it. So in that case, you could say, well, I'm going to give two levels to my captain, I'm going to give one level to my first mate, um, or vice versa. Uh, there, there are some limits there. Basically, your first mate can't get as good as the captain, otherwise, you know, you want to be captain. We, we can't have that. Um, but essentially, you can, you can do that. Um, and every time you level up, you get a specific bonus now uh so say when you go to level one i'm not sure if this is right without checking the book but essentially like you go to level one you can improve a stat you go to level two you can improve a power you go to level three you can learn a new power uh, level four you improve a stat again or something like that so each one is specific but still gives you choice um, but this kind of this is a balancing mechanism to keep people from kind of overloading one aspect of their character. So the captain will improve. Uh, there is no level cap. Um, there's probably a practical one at, at which, you know, there's just not much really left to improve. But 
that'll be so high, I don't see anyone ever getting there. Um, you know, and especially since you, you could, in theory, as a captain or first mate, eventually learn every power in the game. Uh, that's not true. I did actually put a limit, but it's a high enough limit that you're going to start forgetting you have these powers, but um, you come to play. So, <laughs> again, de facto limit. Um, is it set in the same universe as Frostgrave? I don't know. Um, I've never given the question a lot of thought in, in uh, truth. One thing I did want to do was make sure that the stats remain the same. Uh, it, well, that I'm using the same set of stats so that should you want to use a monster from Frostgrave, you can literally pick him up and drop him into uh, Stargrave. The only, the only real difference is you'll notice that the human beings have slightly lower kind of starting armor and slightly higher starting health. Uh, this was this was slightly a game reason just because it's actually slightly more fun that way. But I also justify it by uh, the idea that weapons are just more powerful in the future. But people are either wearing kind of, you know, people have access to better medical equipment. Uh, even, you know, even if you're on the run and such, and, um, you know, better drugs and such to keep going. So everyone's got a little bit lower armor, a little bit higher health, um, but essentially you can still take any any monster from Frostgrave or Ghost Archipelago and, and, and chuck it in. Um, and um, you will see that there are actually uh, a few monsters in the bestiary that look very similar, or at least you could use very similar figures from, from over the cross grave. In fact, I think I think the Magmites, I actually use the same name, but um, but then you've got like Chrono Hounds, not, they're not called Chrono Hounds, they're called Chrono Hounds in Frostgrave, but you've got Warp Hounds in um, Stargrave. They're actually, Warp Hounds are actually scarier than Chrono Hounds. They um, just kind of appear on your spaceship and eat you and then, and then leave. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, so yeah, um, there is a big bestiary because one of the reasons I write this game is that this any game is to give myself an excuse to buy cool figures and then the excuse to put them on the table. And that's that's why Frostgrave existed. And that's why every game has existed for me. It's, I've always been a a miniatures first, I guess, gamer. You know, I, I buy the miniatures and then I figure out the use for them. And, um, and I hope people can. Take, take some of that so that they like, you know, I really want this, whatever it is. Um, I know I can buy it and I can stat it up pretty easy for, for Stargrave and I can use it as the centerpiece for our next scenario. You know, in this one, we're hunting this one or in this one, we're fighting next to the cave or the whatever. And, um, I will, I'll see what I got. I can't, I can't actually remember all the, the creatures. Um, one of the, the problems with, being an author is by the time a game is coming out, I've been working on other things for a year. So <laughs> it's sometimes hard for me to, to remember. Um, so I'll just I'll give you a quick quick rundown. We've got the Bioworm, the Bounty Hunter, the Deadford. Some of the names aren't going to mean a whole lot. Even. What is the Deadford? Oh, yeah, the giant. Deadford's basically a giant frog. Um, you've got a drone, which um, actually can be part of your war band, but also appears. You got a kind of rabbit fox thing. You've got um, some kind of Morlocks. You got the giant hairy woolly rhinoceros. Just saying. Magmite, uh, Mind Gripper, which is kind of a an alien thing that jumps onto the back of your head and bores into your brain. Uh, you got pirate troopers. You got primitives. You got yeah, a giant alien bug. Uh, you got flying, leathery bird things. You got the sewer dragon, the crazy monkey, the space squid. I'm, I'm no longer giving you the actual names because I realize some of the names don't mean anything. Warbots, warpounds. Um, and then you do have also several types of pirates. Um, and pirates, uh, the pirates are the big baddies of the setting. Um, if you want, you can imagine them as the Imperial Empire or the Klingons or whoever, but but these are the guys who basically show up and ruin your day. And um, the the idea was that I wanted to force 
players to, to interact with the scenario. Um, but in a game where you can shoot at each other, it's very easy to sit back and think, you know what, actually, I'll just stand behind this wall and shoot until my opponent's dead. Well, you can't do that because as you sit there shooting, you're basically making a lot of noise and someone's going to show up and it's probably going to be the pirates and the pirates are scarier than you. Um, not individually, but the fact is they never stop coming once they show up. So you basically, there, there's a built-in time limit to, the, to the, some of the scenarios, which is you want to get that loot and get out of there because bigger, badder, meaner pirates are coming. Um, and how that plays out is, so there's, there's two charts. Uh, that's called the unwanted attention. Some scenarios use unwanted attention, which is the more you shoot, the more the pirates show up. Uh, just the more you're there, the more the pirates show up. And then there is a random encounter chart, which is more for your kind of, we're in the middle of a jungle. There wouldn't be any pirates here, but there are, you know, crazy monkeys and, and uh, dragon things and, you know, bugs. <laughs> so, and like I said, you know, the stats, it's pretty simple. Once you play the game a while, you're going to understand pretty easily how you can stat up your own monsters and stat up anything. Um, so that's that's my overview of the book. Um, like I said, I, I'm sure I've left all kinds of stuff out. Uh, spend just a minute talking about the future of the game, uh, and then I'll, I'll answer some questions after I have a drink. Um, one of the, the great things about Stargrave um, and the fact that it's published by Osprey is that they've really committed to it. Um, they, they've already contracted me to write three supplements. Um, and I can't remember when they come out, but if you check Amazon, I think you can already see two of them. Um, so the first one's Quarantine 37, which is a really unfortunate title. Uh, the title was decided several months before COVID, um, and just looks horribly prophetic, but, um, Quarantine 37 is about a big abandoned space station that's been under quarantine, but nobody really knows why. And it was my excuse to bring basically space zombies and alien-esque xenomorphic bugs into the game. Um, so that, that's a, that's a book about, you know, fighting in the kind of close confines and bringing the horror element of sci-fi into it. Um, and then the second one's called the last prospector. And that's kind of taking a more Western theme. Uh, so it's all set in a system that's mainly powered by asteroid mining. And you kind of jump around the system, dealing with different groups and, and fighting on different asteroids and such like that. And um, that one's got kind of a, lo a little bit of a political angle to it, but also, yeah, kind of a very Western feel. And then the third one is going to be called Hope Eternal. And that is going to be a full campaign to play either solo or cooperatively. And it's also going to be your first chance to kind of be a hero in the setting. Um, if, while the setting is very light, because um, I don't like to overdefine settings because I want to leave the players to define that as much as they want, uh, it is quite a grim setting in the sense that the, the universe is gone to pot and there's these giant pirate fleets flying around and no one seems to be able to do anything about it. So they're just kicking everybody around. Well, Hope Eternal, you're going to you're going to get your shot to, to take on the pirates and, and hopefully, you know, if you're that kind of guy, bring a little more peace and justice to the, to the galaxy. Um, but if you'd rather uh, just be a bounty hunter going after scores, as I said, I'm going to release dead, give away dead or alive too. So you can spend more time doing that. Um, so that's, that's what's coming out. And then I hope and plan for there to be more beyond that, but that's, that's a lot for my brain to hold at the moment. So hopefully some good stuff. Um, and now I will start looking, looking at some questions. I don't know if we actually, did we use the, the Q and A or is everybody just kind of, I know there's, all right, lots of open questions. All right. So I'm just gonna start going through a few of these and answer them for you. So. How big or small are the shuttles for the hangar scenario meant to be? Um, I think I'll see if I gave an actual size. The, the truth is not too big because you're going to want to put five of them on what is not a very big table. Um, 
but I don't know if I specified exactly. Starport raid. That's four small spaceships. Oops. About four inches by six will do, but any size is fine. So there you go. <laughs> Not a... Will a player's 10 man crew need its own spaceship? Need? No. Um, so the spaceships are represented in the game uh, in a similar way to bases are in Frostgrave. Uh, so they, they exist outside of actual scenarios, but you can buy upgrades for them, um, things that will help you either during the scenario or after the scenario. You know, you can get, you can buy new med bays or additional cargo space or things like that. So that said, I expect some people will want to model their spaceships. And I'm, I'm thinking about writing some scenarios or writing some rules where you can use them in the game, or not use them in the game, but at least use them as an, an escape uh, mechanism. You know, the, the problem with having spaceships show up is their weaponry will just make a mess of, of the crews. But, um, so we got one person asking for how well uh, Stargrave, Frostgrave works for solo gaming. So like I said, I am going to release a, um, a little supplement that will allow you to do some solo gaming uh, right off the bat with Stargrave. Uh, if you're really into solo gaming, I wrote uh, an entire supplement uh, for Frostgrave called Perilous Dark based on solo gaming. And if you plan to do a lot of solo gaming, I, I suggest you, you give it a look because while it is geared toward Frostgrave, it's really, at least half the book is devoted to mechanics, methods, and philosophy of solo gaming and really tips that can be used in, in any kind of, any solo small warband game anyway. Um, and really, even the scenarios in Perilous Dark, you could probably translate pretty easily into Stargrave. But um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of a lot of solo potential. Uh, usually, when I do solo gaming, I don't suggest people just setting up two warbands and going at it because it doesn't work out that way without the human intelligence on the end. It's better to kind of use some of the techniques described there. Um, to, to create a, a different experience, you know, it tends to work better. But, but yeah, uh, I think as as far as solo gaming goes, it's it's a game that works at works for it pretty well. I mean, there's already in both of them there is an AI system for the monsters. It's pretty simple, but you know, I, I know a lot of people have played Frostgrave just by setting up a table and rolling for random encounters every time, so the monsters are coming on, and you can do the same thing with. With Stargrave, you may want them to be a little bit smarter because, you know, they'll, they'll get gunned down a little easier than they will in Frostgrave. But, all right. Do the templates match up with GW templates? Uh, not exactly. So I can't. The flavor's pretty close. And, and to be honest, if you agree with your opponent before the game, let's use the GW flamer template, then it's going to have no major effect on the game to do that. Um, I can't. In GW, I can't remember what their grenade templates were. So the um, the kind of fragmentation grenade template is 1.5 inches in radius or three inches in diameter, and the, the smoke grenade is four inches. So I think one of those is the small small blast template from GW, but none of them are the, the big one, the, whatever the ordnance template. So how much of a flip of melee versus range do you think Stargrave will have? Uh, let's say it was 80, 90, uh, 80, 90% in Frostgrave. Yeah, I'd say it goes the other way. So probably you're only going to see 10 to 20% um, in Stargrave. You're basically going to see melee in a couple of specific situations in Stargrave. Um, one, if you have creatures that, that have no shooting weapons, you know, your, your hairy rhinoceros or your giant bug is just going to, to run up and try to attack you. Uh, the other instance is you have a captain or first mate or soldier that is very specifically designed for uh, close combat. So it's so like the biomorph uh, background choice. Uh, their core powers include a lot of things like growing toxic claws or you know extra armor or things like that, or your mystic your mystic can essentially enchant his hand weapon or, you know, 
power his sword or whatever. Um, so he may want be more inclined to get into hand to hand combat. But but the problem with getting into hand to hand combat is you can get hurt. Whereas if you shoot at somebody, you can't. You know, you either miss or hit. Whereas in hand to hand combat, somebody's probably going to get bumped. So you really got to think about whether it's worth it or not. Uh, the other instance is if somebody's getting away with treasure, it might be worth getting into hand to hand combat to stop them because it'll slow them down more effectively than um, shooting at them unless you feel really good that you can gun them down. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't share any previews for the new plastics because I don't have any. Um, I have seen a lot of renders, but um, unfortunately, that's 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 for North Star to do. And I'm, I'm not allowed. But um, there are there are three box sets, and one of them is. Let's see if I can remember what they are. So there's there's crew. There are soldiers, and then there are. I can't remember what they're named, but they're basically like unarmored guys, fighter guys, and then very heavily armored guys. Um, and I say guys, but um, there's also going to be female heads and there's going to be alien heads. So you can do a lot of different Star Trek, Star Wars style. It's a human, but with a different head, um, kind of aliens, um, and just loads of options and gear and stuff you can stick on. So should be a lot of fun and a lot of diversity that you can bring out of those sets. Uh, as for terrain, as I said, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. If you want your Stargrave to be a slightly more high-tech universe and use the terrain you're using for Infinity, fine. If you want to pull out your old Necromunda terrain, go for it. Um, like I said, if, if all you got right now is, is fantasy buildings, that's fine. For whatever reason, you're your crew's concentrating on the stuff that can be found on the low tech planets, or maybe, you know, this planet completely collapsed and went back to the dark ages, but there's still some good loot lying around underneath. So really whatever you want, um, you know, it's whenever I do my play testing in all honesty, I use a set of blocks because it's just easier because what, what I'm really doing is figuring out the relationship between where things are on the table and, you know, as much as I'd love to set up a beautiful looking table, I often don't have time, especially, you know, since I'm using the dining room table and I got to have it clear for dinner. <laughs> so if I can use blocks, you can use anything. Um, but obviously this is your excuse to get some spaceships, you know, and your excuse to get whatever terrain, if you want that Moss Osley terrain, then, then go get that Moss Osley terrain. Um, so really do whatever you want. Uh, Sounds like heavy weapon, long arm, pistol, and melee weapon should give the right mix. Uh, so yeah, basically your, your weapons are pistol, carbine, which is because rifle didn't sound high tech enough, so carbine. Um, anybody who has a carbine can actually switch it for a shotgun, which is basically shorter range, but more damage. So that um, melee weapon, yeah, melee weapons are not broken into two different they're not hand weapon and two handed weapon like they're on frost grid because by the time you've gotten to this level of technology, it's not the strength of the person swinging the weapon for the most part. It's, you know, whatever monofilament power heated blade it has. So, um, and then you've got your more specialist weapons, your grenade launcher, flamer, uh, rapid fire, which is your big, you know, whatever you want it to be. Dug -a -dug -a -dug -a. Um, yeah, it does cover more than two players. Uh, will Brigade Games run the next starter? I believe so. Uh, I can't say 100% sure, but I believe they've done for every cross grade next to starter and, and want to continue doing. Uh, will it be Space Hulky with rooms or corridors? Uh, no, in general. Um, and there's a very specific reason for that. And, and I, one of these days, I'm going to write a blog about it. But um, the whole corridor setup or, or a dungeon setup in, in Frostgrave is really tricky as a game designer uh, because you're not, unless you're very specifically designing that dungeon, what you get with those setups is choke points uh, because you, you tend to be you end up limited to kind of one, two or three corridors that run 
the length of the board or become very specific things. If you can jam those points, the game just ends almost. Um, so it's really important not to set up a board that way unless your game is very specifically designed to do that. One, one time you can do that is if you're playing solo or cooperatively, then it doesn't matter so much because it's, it's more fun as the player to fight through. But when you're playing with two or more players, it's really unfun to have that point choked and, and the game basically reduced to everybody fighting around one door and nothing really happening. So, um, so I don't suggest doing that. That said, if you have kind of corridor terrain, you can use that as kind of buildings on the table. It's, you know, it's fine if you're using a few pieces of it kind of as a building you can go into, but I wouldn't set up your entire table that way. Um, just to further reasons I described. Uh, how items and equipment work in Stargrave. Um, you mean in terms of, this is, sorry, Nick, uh, in terms of kind of what someone can carry. So like, so captains, I think have six items that they can carry, six item slots or gear, I've got it all gear because it sounds more sci-fi than, um, than items um, to carry your, your weapons and stuff. Um, though that said, some of your weapons especially take up more than one slot. So you're like, your rapid fire, your heavy machine gun actually takes three, your grenade launcher I believe takes two. Um, so you're limited and then, you know, you probably want one slot for your armor. Um, so you really have to think about, you know, is it worth carrying the, the machine gun, meaning that I won't be able to carry as much gear. Uh, that's not a big deal right when you start the game because you're going to be limited to kind of what's in the general armory. But as you play through a campaign and you hopefully start collecting more high tech stuff, you know, especially if you're captains and your first mates, are they going to want to to carry a big weapon when they could be carrying some of this you know, high tech or alien tech? You know, that's that's really up to to you. So, uh, how much bigger should the play area be with three or four players? I. So basically, yeah, so I play two and a half by two and a half with two players, more or less. Um, for three players, I would up that to three foot square. For four players, I would up to four foot square. These are all just general guidelines. It doesn't make a huge difference as long as you're in that range. It actually makes slightly less difference in Stargrave than it did in Frostgrave uh, for the reason that you're not going to run quite as directly in Stargrave. In Frostgrave, you could get away with it a little bit because there was less missile weaponry. Whereas in, in Stargrave, if you run out in the open, you'll get gunned down. Um, and also because you have to spend time unlocking loot tokens, unlike you did in Frostgrave. So, so the smaller areas still present more challenge and, and you won't just be able to kind of dash in and, and dash off like you could if you played in too small of a, a frost grade board. Uh, are there any road crew type programs to support people that want to volunteer and promote the game and shop with demos? I don't know. Um, you'll, you'd, you'd have to talk to Osprey about that. Um, all, all the marketing is done well, apart what I'm doing here today. <laughs> but, but you know, all the, the official marketing is handled by Osprey and I don't, I don't know specifically what they've got in place. Um, I realized I should have been clicking on done as I answered these, as that would make my life much more easy. Uh, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, what kind of bad guys will need to start? Um, yeah, I, I would start with a handful of pirates. Um, and the pirates break down into basically ruffians, losers with pistols, troopers, guys with decent armor and decent rifles, shock troopers, which are your heavy combat armor guys, and bounty hunters, which can be, you know, any cool old guy you got. So if you if you got a few of them, you're good to go. You can start. Um, and there are a bunch of other alien monsters. Don't feel like you need to specifically get them. Um, just get what you want. And, and the, the best thing I suggest to people is if, if you want to I would take your miniatures that you potentially want to use 
put them on a piece of paper and write a number next to them. And if you ever have a random encounter, just roll and you get the one that you have on your piece of paper. So you're guaranteed to, to always <laughs> get a monster that you have miniatures for. Some of the some of the scenarios do have specific monsters. So like one has a sewer dragon, which can be any kind of big wizard, essentially. Um, and like one has the the rabid foxy kind of creatures. Uh, so some some dogs of some sort. If you if you've got a decent selection of, of fantasy miniatures, probably are out there. But but really, it, you know, to play a standard game, all you need is your crew and probably some pirates. And you can worry about the rest, the rest as you get going. I love loot about how big are the weapons and equipment treasure tables. Um, let me see if I can. So big, I can't even find them. It's just because I can't remember where I put them. So, so you've got you got an advanced you got an advanced weapon table that's got twenty entries. You've got advanced technology tw table, advanced technology table one, which has twenty entries. You have advanced technology table two, which has twenty entries. You've got alien artifact table, which has twenty entries. Um, and like I said, you can also find information and secrets. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff you can get. Um, and every time I write a supplement, I try to put in a new table of at least 20 items. So there's lots of different stuff you can find. And, um, and that's going to continue to go up as I continue to work on it. So you'll never find it all. Um, does melee attract unwanted attention? Uh, no, uh, I, I sort of misspoke. It's not. It's not necessarily fighting that that does it. The fighting, it's really based on the turn. So basically, every turn you're you're rolling a die, and adding the turn number and comparing that to the unwanted attention table, and basically the higher the result, either the more bad guys you get or the the more quality bad guys you get. So basically, each turn you're getting a plus one on that table, and um, yeah, so by, by turn six, you're getting a plus six on that table. So you're much more likely to start getting the shock troopers and stuff showing up. So again, it's not about really the shooting per se. It's about just being there and making a lot of noise. Um, any plasma type weapons that might overheat? Um, no, although I did actually forget the, the jamming rule. So it's, I call it the jamming rule, but basically if you now if you roll a one, then your weapon either jams or you've run out of ammunition or Something's happened that's causing you to pause um, and take a moment to, to service your weapon in, in some way or another, even if that's just sticking another magazine, uh, which just adds a kind of another fun element of, you know, I'm, a, I'm out of ammo. Um, and some weapons do jam a little easier than others. So, so there is an element of that in there. Um, and it also aids in, in scenario writing. So like, you know, in quarantine 37, where you're, you're cut off from your ship as you play through the scenarios. Uh, you start jamming easier to represent that you're you're starting to run low on ammunition. What does my wife think of all this? Well, she, she's not she's not thrilled that that I'm here talking to you instead of helping get the kids ready for bed. But, um, <laughs> my my wife my wife is very proud of me, um, but she has no interest in what I do. Uh, <laughs> She played Frostgrave with me once, said that was all right, and, and that was about it. Um, she's a fantasy fan. Uh, you know, she loves Lord of the Rings and, and Harry Potter and stuff, but gaming beyond kind of classic family board games has no particular interest to her. Is there one Reaper mini that you think everyone should have in their Stargrave collection? Um, unfortunately, I don't have it in the hand. But um, there, um, I've got a I've got an alien in here called the Paragoda, who's basically the big bug, and um, I can't remember. I'm not saying I based it directly on this Reaper figure, but uh, there is it's one of the Bones figures where it's a 
it's a big bug with like an ant eyes and he's got like three clawed hands and um, you know he stands about 50 mil tall i get that guy <laughs> he's just awesome um, and yeah i once once i had one of those i thought man, i need an excuse to get this guy into the game so so a creature very much like him is up here hey joseph yeah we're running out of time here no, oh, I mean we're we're a little bit over time. I let you go over okay. a little bit, uh, but that's okay. Um, but I do have to start getting ready for other classes, so I just wanted to drop in and, and let everybody know that if okay. you want to ask Joseph some questions, head over to his Discord channel and maybe we'll he'll check it out maybe tomorrow morning or whenever he has yep. a free time to go check out some questions if he has some time. I can do that. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to say thanks for everybody, and we're going to be wrapping up in a few more minutes, so you can go ahead and do your okay. your final final steps. Alrighty. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I will I will check out the Discord channel. Also, you can you can find me on Facebook, just under Joseph McCullough, and I'm happy to get messages. Um, if you're not every part of it, there is a Stargrave page, um, and also there's my blog, obviously the Renaissance Troll, where I talk about all the things I'm working about and show off all the medals I'm painting uh, to my, the best of my ability. Um, so yeah, so come and hang out and drop me a, drop me a line on the Discord and I will try to get on and, and answer all the questions I see on the Discord channel. And um, thanks for thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate you guys coming out and listening to the game. And I hope you give it a try. And um, if you don't like it, don't tell me. But if you do like it, let me know. Um, and hopefully we can all have some fun because that is the, the point of the whole thing. Um, Alrighty guys, I will.